The next speaker is Jason Middleton. And um, I'm not sure how to introduce Jason. I, I first, I first uh, met Jason and his wife Robin uh, at TGIF here at Scripps in the early 1977, shortly after I arrived. And uh, to put it pretty bluntly, they helped me keep together until uh, I managed to talk Sabina into following me uh, from Australia here later in 1977. Um, so Jason and I go back to uh, our time here at Scripps. Um, both uh, Jason and Russ Davis uh, talked me into learning to fly in those days, uh, which was a great, great experience uh, for me. And our relationship has continued uh, since then. And we managed to, uh, a few years ago, in fact, back, back in 2008, we managed to even do an experiment together uh, on Lady Elliot Island on the Great Barrier Reef. And this was, this was looking at whether we could actually use remote sensing um, of the waves uh, over the, uh, coming in uh, over the reef uh, as a way of estimating the you know, total dissipation uh, of energy uh, effectively in the reef. And we did that with airborne measurements and in situ measurements. So that was, that was quite great fun spending, uh, I think it was three weeks on a on uh, the southernmost tip of the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, so I, uh, we continue to, dis to discuss ways of, of working together. Uh, but in the background there is a, has been an enduring friendship over, the, over those years. So, uh, Jason, uh, tell us about Wandering the Reef. say, would you buy used car from this man? <laughs> the answer is, yeah. Let me just uh, connect this up for a moment. So, uh, yeah, so Ken and I go back nearly 40 years, of course, and um, he's one of the grand old men now of Scripps and a leader, as most of you uh, will have come to, uh, to know. And, uh, and of course, it wasn't always such. So, um, I arrived here in 76 to work with. Uh, a, a fellow named Ted Foster who did Antarctic Oceanography. Now, Ted liked this. He liked to go and spend 12 weeks a year in Antarctica and uh, I thought that was okay once or twice, but after that I thought that was uh, perhaps not a good idea. But uh, what, Ken arrived and we didn't kind of know how it worked. You know, we come from Australia, I came from Melbourne, Ken came from Sydney. It's different. We had advisors. Russ was a great advisor. To me, I met Russ before I came here, and uh, we talked flying and so on, and Ray, and, uh, and and we're very grateful. I was very grateful for them to provide give us some background, how to do things. You know, when, when you're a young postdoc from Australia, how do you get money? How many beers do you buy the program manager <laughs> before he'll give you a grant? How do you do this stuff, right? How does it work? Who do you upset? Who do you not upset around here at Scripps in order to get on? You know? Kind of move aside. It's an uh, interesting question. So, um, so we had one of those discussions early on, and they, they were very interesting because, uh, yeah, we're just learning our way. So, I, I arrived and uh, to work with with Ted, and I think Russ and Ray inducted me, and I think Ken as well, into uh, the ways and means, the way things were done here at Scripps, and that was great. 
Okay. Um, I remember Ken being bemused because uh, we, when we had meetings up there in the IGPP meeting room, uh, we'd all get there you know, five minutes early to be polite for the, for the seminar speaker. John Miles would turn up at five minutes early and he'd shit, five, go back to his office and do five minutes more work, write three more papers before he came out for the seminar. <laughs> So uh, we used to run on school speech. Um, there's a, uh, over here, I was in Sverdrup Hall. Uh, Ken wasn't too far away because I was at IGPP. We used to run on the beach and you could, there was a big weighing machine there. You know? We were both less than 200 pounds, would you believe? Anyway, time ticks on. I moved back to Australia and uh, I went back to Australia to a, a different laboratory, uh, which was partly the Barrett Reef. So when I went back, and this is just a precursor to the stuff that, that, that I'm going to talk about with you, um, it's a very long laboratory. It's you know 1,500 kilometres long, and places 250 kilometres wide. Uh, this is good. This is the continental shelf. <coughs> Extensive coral reef systems and complex ecology. I knew about <coughs> ecology. I still don't know any ecology. All I know is that the biologists, when you go to sea, have to do their plankton surveys at night, leaving us physical oceanographers to work respectable business hours during the day that the biologists take over the ship at night. So some of the key physical processes I, um, I worked on um, were tides around broad sound. I'll show you a diagram later. Broad sound is an area where the shelf is very wide, almost 200 kilometers wide, and that's provides a focusing of the incoming tide, just like a, a magnifying lens, and, uh, and then a narrowing estuary. So you get a factor of about six on top of the normal tide at spring tide. That gets interesting. Um, the reefs are very interesting. Of course, the coral polyps are only as big, um, but reef systems are very long. And so almost immediately you come down and think about parameterization. How do we parameterize flow through reefs, across reefs, over reefs? And I've had a little bit of experience of trying to do that and, and uh, work on some problems. Um, very challenging. And of course, that's one of the issues which is important in climate change models. And so I'm always a little bit suspicious when our climate change models come up with these parameterization schemes because I know that it's very difficult to get it to work. Um, Shelf and slope circulation on the Barrier Reef are a combination of many, many different processes. Um, first and second mode continental shelf waves um, are bound. They're modified by the presence of reefs on the outer shelf. Uh, the, 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 the propagation rates change with, with reef density and so on. Um, and of course, the important thing is that the uh, the baroclinic processes on the shelf edge drive the nutrient supply. The corals love nice, clean nutrients out of deep water and don't like dirty runoff. So there's some very interesting processes there, um, and weight flows mostly transit everywhere. Uh, during this time, I had the fortune to work with Mark Merrifield, who came to work with me. Um, <coughs> And Janet Becker, his wife, came to work with Roger Grimshaw at the same time while we were at UNSW. So we had some interesting experiences, uh, Mark and I, at sea, trying to look at uh, uh, coastal trap waves scattering around Fraser Island. And uh, try and keep friends with Mark to this day, although it's always hard to catch up with people. Roger, uh, of course, has always um, been a long, a long standing friend. And, uh, I. Uh, Carl said, don't let him need equipment. Yeah, that's exactly right. Roger is good at his, uh, his mathematical mechanics rather than his uh, practical mechanics. Um, so one of the things I became interested in is weight flows. And, and because the tidal tides are tides, uh, they come and go. Um, and so weight flows are often transient. Well, they're nearly always transient. Um, so the, a whole range of issues that, that come up with that um, meant that when I went back uh, and started to work on these, some of these problems, there were no other measurements in some of those areas. 
So we, we were able to, to measure some of the first, first uh, large scale currents, large scale tidal flows. Um, uh, basically, um, almost ever, yeah, so we did some of the first measurements. So this sets the scene of some of the work with Ken um, and, uh, and, and with other colleagues. All right, um, now one of the interesting things about corals, which we were able to do, um, I learned about this, uh, almost by accident, Marlon Atkinson, who was at uh, University of Hawaii, ran a really nice little laboratory flume experiment mm -hmm. where he had some corals in a flume, he uh, put some nutrient rich water flow over the corals, over a long flume, and yeah. measured the uptake of nutrients. And you can actually, uh, his work is, is really uh, very interesting because uh, to me, it hasn't got the, the credit that it really deserves, but it, he was able to show that you don't need to worry too much about what sort of benthic organisms you have, but coral type things and the algae and such things that grow in coral reefs will absorb nutrients. And the absorption is basically simply you assume that the, cell, the cells have no nutrients in them, and then you have a diffusion across the cell boundary which is proportional to the concentration outside, and it's also dependent upon the boundary layer thickness. Now, the boundary layer thickness around corals is, di is driven or it's determined by the, the small scale turbulent intensity. Now, with flow over coral reefs, which happens, say, on the incoming tide, it is the, the potential energy difference of the flow across the reef that can actually, that if you assume that's all turned into kinetic energy, then you can actually get estimates of boundary layer. So curiously, perhaps, by looking at potential energy change across a reef flat, you can actually estimate how much nutrient is uptaken on the reef flat. So you go from a, a, a global, robust calculation of potential energy loss and you can actually determine the nutrient uptake and there's small little characters called polyps and everything else. So we uh, we did that experiment um, up on the uh, Warriba Island on the uh, Far Northern Barrett Reef and that worked kind of well. So um, there's some interesting things happening there which don't uh, you don't normally come across in in the sort of well, I think, that, that, that exists here in, uh, in California. It exists to some extent in other parts of the world, uh, but we have the strong tidal currents, we have wind-driven currents, <coughs> uh, free and force mode, shelf waves, and all of those things act independently. And so a lot of the processes which drive the biology are, they're, uh, they're episodic when Different period, period, different periodicity actions work together. So let's uh, move on a little bit, and that's uh, part of the Lady Elliot Island Lagoon at low tide and at high tide. So you can see on the left that there is uh, a number of corals actually protrude; and they grow beyond the normal spring low tide low, uh, a few centimeters perhaps. And at high tide, there might be, in the Lady Elliot Island Lagoon, there might be a metre or so across the, across the reef flat. And, uh, and so Ken and his group, Luke, um, uh, Ben Reinerman and Nick Statham were interested in um, looking at some of these issues. So Ken and I say friends, he's not a bad man. Regardless, <laughs> regardless, regardless of his uh, used car activities. But he, 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 he is worth defending, I think. Because he used to have an endless supply of green beauty uh, in, in those days, early days. Anyway, we finally uh, decided on a, uh, a try and get some. It's, it's a trick, you know. These funny agencies you know, convince them that you're going to do something interesting, and so we finally, finally talked Ken to a project, and we got some money from the <coughs> Australian Research Council, um, and we planned our holiday to the Lady Elliot Island in the Southern Great <laughs> Barrier Reef. <coughs> And it's a national park with a small resort uh, on one side. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, and after we finished, 
I got an invoice from the island. So they were uh, for about 25,000 bucks and uh, the accountants went crazy. What? What's going on? They must have thought I had, you know, a dozen girlfriends or something on the island for a month. But no, it was just Ken and his group. And uh, so we finally got the bill paid, which was good. So <coughs> Lady Early Island is um, pretty much, so let me find the point of here.
my technician very helpful. There'd be observational tower in the end, and we've all had all sorts of stuff on the uh, on the, the lagoon floor in about one to two meters depth, with, but with patchy reefs in between. Uh, quite quite a, an interesting area. The, the Marine Parks Authority of Australia says you are not allowed to put anything there which is going to have any residual <coughs> sign. Well, you know, I can show you anchors there that disappear at about uh, you know, old ships' anchors that come and go. Um, stuff disappears very quickly, and, and things will grow on on uh, on anything in that time at all. So there's a huge array of instrumentation there to measure measure a dissipation and so on. And uh, I think this is this is one of the ones that uh, that's interesting. So the airborne measurements showing from uh, from the ocean the ocean here coming over the reef flat and into the lagoon uh, show significant dissipation on the outer reef and then further dissipation in the lagoon and uh, those measurements show that. So an interesting experiment I mean, and a good place to work because at the end of the day you just walk into the lagoon bar for dinner <laughs> and uh, you're not allowed to work at night and it's unsafe to be bikings in the, uh, in the reef lagoon. So you have to sit down and have a rest and uh, get up the next morning and do it again. So um, the airborne LIDAR uh, were able to map the entire reef area. So this is the island itself. This is the strip north-south. Uh, this is the lagoon where most of the measurements were made and sections across here. Uh, and this is the, the deeper water outside. Um, so, and this is about 600 metres there, so the whole, the whole cave is about a kilometre by almost a kilometre that way. Now, part of what I did with my team is actually go out in small boats. Or actually, I made right in the cave go out in a small boat and do most of that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, we beetled backwards and forwards with an ADCP. So we bolted an ADCP to the dive boat, and backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And some of the interesting areas, <coughs> quite a lot of these, I won't show you any others, but what happens is that the flow on the incoming tide flows around, but it, there's residual flows. There's pockets of residual flows here. What you'd expect, small wakes here in the yard. Uh, and, and when the, when the tide goes out of the way, of course, the wakes come in the other direction. Tides are not actually rectilinear in most of our they, they, The tidal ellipse is an ellipse, not a... Not a and, uh, so, of course, this all changes with the time. But this part of the island here is interesting because this is where the manta rays aggregate. Now, um, I was fortunate enough to be in Walter's house to see a picture with about 2,000 manta rays. I don't know whether the Australian manta rays are not that friendly. They don't get together like that. They can't be my class to stay away from each other. Uh, and, uh, but the reason why they aggregate here is, I think, um, one, of the core, one of the core reasons is that it, it's an area which is nutrient rich. So what happens is we get, um, this is some of the stuff we did outside of the lagoon. So, <coughs> Propagating from further south, this is a, a temperature tidbits we put in on some moorings just off the off to the north of the island. So what we're getting here, this is basically 19 to 23, 24 degrees. So we're getting five degree uh, pulses of five degree cool water coming from the continental slope from several hundred meters down. They don't come all the time. Uh, this is for this is 15th of the 4th, this is the 1st, the 5th, 15th, the 5th, 6th, 1st, the 6th. So we're going basically, that's, that's a month, so this is a two week period. So we've seen obviously the spring tide pulses, spring tides bring a lot more water up, but only ever slightly, not every time. Partly, we think this is due to, uh, to wind as well. So this is predominantly tide, but also enhanced by wind. So we get pulses of nutrient-rich water um, from time to time, and then they're facilitated as well by uh, tidal uplift 
in the last segment around the island. So here is a tidal upwelling signal, which is perhaps, uh, well, it's probably just a sort of a, a fraction of a degree coming up and, and floating around the island. So we had uh, a set of measurements here, which we did with uh, CTD and so on. Okay, so we're starting to get a picture, which is probably self-evident to you, but no one's done this sort of stuff before in this area. Um, so we've got tidal upwelling, we've got wind-driven upwelling, some coastal trap wave pulses moving up and down the coast. They're all facilitating to get this, these occasional really big pulses of water, cold water, which will be nutrient rich. So, um, so the most frustrating thing about the Barrier Reef is when you're trying to take a picture of your buddy, your dive buddy's swim fins, <laughs> and you get manta rays all the way around the place, right? You, you just can't, you can't survive. Let me try and make this work for you. Um, so this is a wasn't it didn't happen on this trip, but um, it happened on another trip, and uh, we're just snorkeling with a camera. Fortunately, Let's see if I can make this work. Can I make this work? Here we go. All right, so having a quiet snorkel, trying to take a picture of the seabed, sediments, and then look what happens. Pesky manta rays. <laughs> Coming back, having a feed. See the one behind, and the one to the right? They have no fear of people. So you look at it, you're trying to get a picture of a man around in one direction, another one swims past you. So small squadrons of them fly off into the distance and then uh, the next thing you're attacked from behind. <coughs> then they turn around, come back in for another pass. Apparently, the, uh, the locals, uh, if you take a picture of the underside of the manta ray, they all have different patches. So uh, they've identified some hundreds now that, are, uh, that live around that same area. So, um, so the, the, uh, those waters are relatively, uh, it's, it's a little bit evident there. Um, the parity's not all that great. And the parity's not all that great because it's mainly plankton-filled water, soup. Man can see. All right, so that's good. Um, that's interesting stuff. So it provides a motivation for what we're doing. And uh, if I go back there and do some more, we'll do that. But so, so I got interested in airborne lidar, and um, and uh, as I mentioned before, I've uh, been flying for a while, um, 46 years actually. And uh, so um, Ken's airborne lidar intrigued me. And I thought I'm going to get one of those. <coughs> But the funding agencies in Australia, I had to spend and connive and talk and buy my program manager and lots of beers and eventually I was able to uh, uh, get myself an airborne LIDAR. And uh, of course you need not only the LIDAR but a GPS and an inertial motion unit put together and so on. And so uh, I, I've been now especially from going to sea in large ships, particularly for Antarctica, that seems like a silly thing to do. For me. It's good for some people but not for me. And airborne lidar is much more sensible because you get to you know, finish at the end of the day and go and have dinner and a glass of red wine. <laughs> so um, the good thing about airborne lidar is it's um, it, you can measure absolutes. So surveying can be done with airborne lidar, but for a lot of us, it's not what there is; it's how it changes, which is exciting. And um, so lidar is really good because it gives you direct measurements. Stereoscopic photogrammetry, which is, which is uh, used by some of those people that use their little uh, little toy airplanes, you know, that's uh, uh, it has issues of reliability and accuracy. Um, 
sorry, I hope no one else here is a, a, a EUAS driver, EUAB driver. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and, and they're labor intensive because uh, in Australia, I think it's true here, if you want to survey a beach using uh, one of these little unmanned aerial vehicles, you have to be line of sight, you have to take it along, get it out, plug it in, fly a beach, take it down, download the data, pack it up, drive to the next beach and do the same again. And um, what we've been doing is, uh, fortunately, we've been uh, able to work and do beach after beach. And, uh, and that's what Ken and Luke have been doing, which is interesting. And so we've got this common interest now in airborne LIDAR. Um, rapid mobilisation ahead of storms is possible in a, in a light aeroplane. The meteorologists are good, it can give you two or three days, you can actually get up in there and measure stuff before it changes. And, um, and uh, sediment, this is not my area of expertise, but I'm getting interested in it. Sediment moves so fast, not only does it erode quickly, it also comes back quickly, depending on the circumstances. So the other thing is, of course, we can use, um, you can use airplanes in conditions where there's some turbulence, crosswinds, when these little UAVs can't fly. Legal to fly the build up areas of crowds, such as busy beaches, and we can cover large areas, all right? And the commercial equipment now is highly reliable. The, um, the, 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 we, we both use Regal instrumentation, highly reliable, good quality software, good support, and, uh, and that makes life easy as a scientist. Don't have to rebuild your system. So to get, so we've got common systems, um, our platform, we're using a part of PA44, which is a, uh, a, a Seminole, uh, low-wing twin. Um, this is our original LiDAR, not, not our new LiDAR. We've got a, a VQ480i and uh, uh, a span GPS IMU and no control system. Uh, Ken and Luke's system, they use a part Navia, P68, high wing. A little bit better you can look down, but in the end it doesn't matter. We, we put a camera in the bottom of our aeroplane so that the pilot can see when we're flying over the beach. You can see which beach you're flying over, um, so it's fairly straightforward. And, um, and so we've both got similar systems now. Of course, uh, Ken and Luke have got this uh, hyperspectral camera. We've got a Brandywine uh, hyperspectral camera that we bought from um, a company called Brandywine. John Fisher used to work with, with uh, NRL. And uh, we're still working on ours, it's not quite working. All right, beach surveys. Let's do a couple of beach surveys. So recent storms. On the west coast, you have got the El Nino uh, uh, of earlier this year. And on the Australian east coast, we had an east coast low on June 5th. And so, whilst the abstract process is a different in a sense, high winds, right, strong winds, combination of high tides, Spring tides, storm surge, longshore drift, large wave heights, and off you go. You've got sediment erosion. So we'll look at uh, look at both sides of the of the uh, city. So uh, our storm off the coast of New South Wales, eastern Australia, was on June the fifth, and it's an east coast low trough, propagated eastward, provided winds. I'll show you in a moment from the northeast and the southeast, and it happened right at very, very, one of the highest spring tides. 2.85 metres high tide is the highest we get. Um, and it occurred on 23rd of June 15th, June 5th. And so it's a new moon and we had uh, some really significant wave heights. So we were able to, with a few days warning, get out and do our pre-storm measurements over some selected beaches. Not the whole of New South Wales, but selected beaches. Later, we're, we're now trying to do 100 beaches. Um, the whole of New South Wales in fact. So historically, um, beach with the time series, this is what happens, is that the beach gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, wider and wider and wider, storm. Beach grows, storm. Right? Big storms happen sometimes, big storms. So that's a time series over many years. And typically the big storms happen no more than once a year. That's good, because it gives the beach time to rebuild in the meantime. So the New South Wales storm of June 5th was a, a low push system here. Here it is in colour. And I'll just try and get this working for you. And it, this is a night happens. So this is Australia, this is the east coast of Australia right here. 
It's all hard to see, but you'll soon see it uh, spin up. Oops. Back up. There we go. So on day, daytime, nighttime comes. And uh, this is a, this low, which was predicted to be a sort of a circular low, has gone right into a trough, a long trough which runs along the whole coast. Very strong winds from the northeast, pounding down the coast, followed as the, as the whole system moves offshore, followed by a flick of winds, really strong winds from the south and southwest. So very intense, one of the most intense storms we've had. Uh, and largest scale storms we've had over New South Wales for some time. All right. That's it. Yeah. So, uh, NOAA forecast, five minutes significant wave height. So, it's, uh, this, is, this is good stuff. And uh, we deployed our aeroplane. Uh, the team was deployed to, with um, jet skis to try and measure some of the offshore beach sediments and uh, I'll talk about two beaches which is the uh, Narrabeen Collaroy Beach here and Bilboa. This is a long beach about, uh, oh, about two and a half kilometres with headlands at the end. Bilboa is a very short beach, only three or four hundred metres long with very big headlands so it's a different sort of scenario. Um, now before, we'll hard to see here, this one, this is a, look at this area here this is before and this is after. This is after, this is after. So this guy's swimming pool was up here, and now this guy's swimming pool is down here. And this area is an area where it's, it is just sand dune. So they've been allowed to build on what unconsolidated uh, coastal area. Everyone knew it was a hot spot, but the houses were built 100 years ago, so, so these people all feel sorry for themselves. Um, people who, you know, $10 million properties, the rest of us sort of, well, no one got hurt, so not so bad, good for science. So uh, what we've done is uh, we've looked at, and it's a little hard, to, uh, what we've done here is we've tried to do before and after stuff. So the nice thing about LIDAR is, is that you don't have to get absolutes when you've got storms like this. You just look at differences. So we see that the interesting differences is that there's a huge, uh, and, and this is oriented, so north is to your left, Sorry, because I want to fit it crossways. North is to your left. There's a big patch of erosion here. There's some patches of erosion around the house, <coughs> which is where the damage is done. And there's very little in the middle and hardly any up the north end. It's kind of weird. There's no, there's no rocky substrate here. So how the, there's no, no offshore reefs here. So we've got some sort of processes here which are favoring some rather than others. So this area here is, uh, is where the sand has gone. Over. More than two metres of sand, more than three metres of sand has gone from here. And, and this is what it looks like, looks like after. <coughs> All right, so we can, uh, using a uh, quick terrain map, we can look at some stuff. So this section here, which is where the houses were, uh, were going into the water, we've got uh, before, that's just little shrubs out there on the sand dunes. This is after. Now, this is, this is immediately after, just a few days after, and this is three months after. Now, this is partly a rebuild because some, some berms were put up in front of the house, but this is all genuine, natural rebuild uh, through deposition. If we go to the far northern end where there wasn't much happening, we've got, uh, we've got a little bit of uh, before, after, a little bit of rebuild. Nothing much happened up here. If we go just about 200 metres further south than that, we get into an area which there's a lot of red in the other diagram. It's all hard to see here, but um, the difference before and after is huge. So we've now got something like uh, 40 metres of beach, of which we've lost two, two metres, two plus metres, 40 to 50 metres by two plus metres, more than 120 cubic metres for that particular meter along the shore. That's many truckloads gone in two days. But look, in three months, half of it's built back in. If you do the rough calculation, you're getting three centimeters a day rebuilt back up 
in, a, in an environment where the storms aren't particularly big. So this is big, this is big science, so lots, lots of things happening here. Um, and so uh, uh, this work was done, by the way, with Ian Turner uh, at uh, Water Research Laboratory and his team. And uh, this is actually one of his diagrams, so they've, they've just taken this. It's a nice way of depicting where the, where the sand goes from. That, that area here, the northern area, is where I just showed you. Okay. So, uh, and if you look at this, again, it's before or after. Right, Bill Gola. Now, this is the uh, beach with the with, uh, headlands either end. <coughs> and we've got, this is uh, before, after, and then the rebuild. It's rebuilt. This is rebuilt in three months. For this end of Bilgola, but the other end of Bilgola is not yet rebuilt. So there's some really interesting questions here. Whether or not there's wake eddies uh, modulating, which I think might be happening, you're having wakes flow around headlands, modulating the wave intensity on the different parts of the beaches. I think that may be happening. Um, no way of really telling that. It's hard to get measurements during these storms. Um, Ken and uh, Luke kindly gave me some diagrams from their stuff here. And uh, here we go, of course, right here. Uh, and and uh, those dates. Uh, for me to read October 2015, January and March 2016, and uh, same sort of patterns um, on, on, on the beaches here in California, of course, and the naval base of Coronado where they uh, broke into their car park, <coughs> and bird rock as well. Okay, so, so some of the questions that I'm starting to think about now um, in my, my next scientific uh, endeavours are. Well, so many hundreds of sand, tons of sand come and go. Um, surfers say most of the sand goes offshore, builds sandbars. So it's great for surfing, and then it comes back up again. So it doesn't go very far, it just goes offshore most of Sun goes longshore. Waves are nearly always a weekly incident, creating longshore drift with big headlands. Sometimes it can't get around those. Uh, right. But the, the, the deposition rates are very, very high. Um, we have not yet had two severe storms in one year in Sydney. When we do, I think we're going to have some major problems with some of the beaches. Um, so we've done 100 beaches from border to border, and uh, we can do that in about uh, three and a half days of flying if we just fly low tides when we get the beaches. So there's some interesting questions. But there's some simple quantitative data that managers can use. Everyone says, oh, look, it's easy. You have, you have spring tide, you have high tide, it happens concurrently with big waves, you're going to have erosion. That's kind of a, a duh statement. But how do you quantify that? When are you going to worry about that if you're a coastal manager? Can you actually create government policy on coastal planning, which is going to take into account this stuff? And as sea level rises and storms become more energetic in parts of the world, you know, do we just see the real estate of the ocean? It's all yours, it's fine. Or do we try and armor the coast? And how do we manage the coastal, the coastal areas? I noticed that many areas up in um, California that have got big problems as well. And uh, I'm sure they're tussling with those questions. So, uh, there he is. One of his natural habitats, watering out for the beach. The question on his lips was, is the bar open yet? Thank you, Ken. Well done. Thanks on a great career, and uh, you're now, instead of asking the questions, you're answering the questions about how to go on at Scripps. And um, uh, congratulations, and it's been fun working with you, and I hope we do another one. <laughs>
Yeah, there's a, uh, I didn't say the data, there's a uh, wave run boy just offshore from Sydney. <coughs> We've got the, uh, the data for that, uh, that one work. We had, there was another one, well we didn't, but one, one of the groups that we're working with did. There's, a, uh, there's another one further down the coast that failed, just due to the storm. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's one that we've got directional wave data. Yes, good from the wave run. So that's, uh, that's something that's going to be very interesting to have a look at. One of the biggest problems is that, you know, you can't actually fly, we tried to fly in a storm four years ago, but it wasn't such an intense storm. What it really needs is a really intense storm offshore, which gives big waves without the, without the winds, but this one's blowing 100 kilometers an hour. So, you know, no intrepid pilot's going to fly in that. So, <laughs> not a good idea. so anyway, so that's one of the questions we have a look at that, but we don't know which parts of the beach went first. And, um, and uh, I, I've, I've got a bit of a beach house up the coast, and I was stand, I was in my beach house with my flashlight out in the evening, trying to watch how the, the, the uh, sediment was going through my, my beach house holiday area. And that was very, I was out there for about two hours, and my wife was wondering where I was, and standing there, watching, like, watching the sediment come and go. Uh, so uh, it's difficult. Um, it's difficult to get data, and my own limited experience is that sets of waves come in, and even if they're nominally coming on shore, you get a set coming in, all of a sudden the swash is going that way. And then another set comes and the swash can be going another way. So depending on how the wave groups is coming. Yeah, but I was thinking maybe you don't have the data for the good data for the storm itself, but you give the ocean to the place. But the rebuilding is uh, yeah. just as important. So, so um, with the with uh, Ian Turner, yeah, with Ian Turner and his group, that's that's our ARC proposal is one to do exactly that. So yes, we want to monitor before and after an erosion event, but now we want to watch the rebuild uh, in time, and that's that's part of the project to watch what's the rebuild and try and get some figure out how 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 that works. Yeah, and some quantitative ways. Okay. Well, thanks, Jason.